Hello and welcome to the Permanente Medicine Podcast. I'm Chris Grant, your host and Chief Operating Officer of the Permanente Federation, an organization representing the shared interests of eight Permanente medical groups with nearly 23,000 physicians and over 80,000 employees. These podcasts are designed to get to know some of the most innovative minds in healthcare in a casual setting. I'm very excited for today's recording because I have Dr. Mark Schuster, the founding dean and CEO of the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine, here in the studios with me. Prior to his appointment, Dr. Schuster served as the William Berenberg Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Chief of General Pediatrics and Vice Chair for Health Policy in the Department of Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Additionally, he was named one of Modern Healthcare's 100 Most Influential for 2018. What a long list of accolades. Good afternoon, Mark, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for having me. This is such an exciting podcast because we're going to unveil the new school of medicine and let our listeners know a bit more about what's to come. So I want to start with a question, and I'm thinking ahead to 2020, and you're walking into the room with the first class, and it's the white coat ceremony. What is the most important piece of advice that you want to provide those incoming bright-minded students in the welcoming address? Wow, there's so much. I think that I would most want to tell them or advise them to hold on to their passion. When students show up at med school, they want to save the world. They want to change everything. They want to be phenomenal doctors. They want to be advocates and leaders. And I would love our students to still feel that way when they graduate. So I would encourage them to remember who they are at that point and to continue to hold on to what it was that took them to med school, what it was that got them excited about the privilege of being a physician. That's terrific. And it is such a privilege. There's few professions in life where the individual and the profession become so intertwined and it is all about humanity. Absolutely. So let's turn the clock back even further. And your fondest memories of your medical school experience that you want to make sure exists in the upcoming Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine? So I'd say that many things stand out from medical school, but as I really think about it, what pops into my mind is individual patients. I remember so many patients so distinctly, and when you're a medical student, you have this sudden opportunity to make a difference in someone else's life, and you have often more time than the residents, the attendings, the nurses, the therapists, everyone else around. And so I felt like it was a really special time when I could sit with patients and get to know them, understand their fears, their concerns, try to help address things that they were a little hesitant to share. And so what those are among my fondest memories, the individual patients and the chance I had to become a part of their lives. That's terrific. And it does always come down to that patient entrusting their life uh, in your hands and yeah. often their family members. So I want to kind of discuss with you one of the more inherent challenges within medical education. Studies have indicated that half or more medical students experience burnout and that medical students are three times more likely to die from suicide than the general population in their age range. How has the KP School of Medicine curriculum been designed to influence resilience and the emotional well-being of its students? Yeah, this is a terrible thing going on in medical schools and among physicians and other clinicians and other professions. And so we are trying to take this very seriously. We're going to have two psychologists on staff. All of our students will visit with the psychologist. If after three visits they decide this really isn't for them, they can opt out. But the idea is that our students will see the psychologist throughout the year, throughout the four years, and that if they have a crisis, say, in March of their first year, right. they will already know the psychologist. They'll know where to find the psychologist, and there won't be stigma being seen going in now because everybody's going. And we think that will also be valuable for our students. And as a side benefit, we think 
all clinicians should understand the importance of mental health and mental health care. And this will be an additional way to expose our students, regardless of what field they go into, to the value of mental health care. I love that concept of it's built in for several reasons. One, it's built in because it's a wonderful education tool. Two, it just is seen as normal, routine, um, to your point, destigmatized. Absolutely. One other thing we're doing is we also think that the fact that we are integrating biomedical science, clinical science, and health system science all together into the learning, all together into the cases, so they're learning them all at the same time, means that they won't be sitting in a biochemistry course for half a year feeling like it's pretty disconnected from why they went to medical school. They will understand just how important biochemistry is because they will be learning it in tandem with the clinical implications. So we also think that disconnection that many students start to feel because it's a lot of basic science and they're not seeing its value will be different here because they will see its value. We're also going to have them in the clinical setting from the beginning so that they will be able to connect what they're learning in the classroom with real patients and seeing, again, why it's so important. And they went to medical school to become physicians and to work with patients. So they will get that sense of value that you get from working with patients right from the beginning. We are also doing some other things. We are having four weeks a year, one week at a time, and we call these weeks REACH weeks, R for reflection, E for education, A for assessment, C for coaching, and H for health and well-being. And these are weeks where there's a break from the regular curriculum. This is still part of the curriculum. And they will have an opportunity to reflect on how it's going, what's been going on. Did a patient die in the clinical setting a month ago and have they actually worked through that or have they kind of pushed that down and ignored it? They will have a physician coach who will be helping them look at all of their performance, all that's gone on since the last REACH week, and how that's going. Are there any patterns in their performance? If they did poorly on a quiz, did they go through a breakup the day before, or did they really not learn the material? And if they didn't, then look into how they might be able to learn better. And in addition, we're going to be tracking their performance on quizzes and tests all along. So that if a student is having trouble in an area, we're going to have a lot of academic support to help them get back up to mastery of the material rather than having you know, pulmonary be an area that they never quite learned as they move on next month to something else. So we're doing a lot of things to really try to address wellness issues and burnout in our school. And that self-reflection uh, period, yes. those weeks also, I think, are just a chance to reflect upon what occurred over the prior weeks. What did they learn? What mistakes did they make? And what resources do they need? So that all sounds quite wonderful. I feel like one of the biggest topics of conversation since the medical school was announced has been on the significant integration of technology, particularly in anatomy courses. Can you explain the rationale for this to our listeners and share how this will be a benefit to students and their future patients? Yeah, definitely. So we will not have cadavers. We will not have the traditional anatomy lab, but we have what I think is going to be a terrific education in anatomy. So we will be using several modalities. We will be using augmented and virtual reality. And I've put on the HoloLens myself and seen how you can take the heart and you can spin it. You can put your eyes into it and do that with any organ. And it's just amazing because I really liked anatomy, but it was also the case that I didn't always exactly see how different um, body parts really fit together. Right. Because, it, you know, in this case, we'll be able to see it from all angles and then remove it from the body and put it back in the body. So I think this approach to learning anatomy is really terrific, but we don't stop there. We're also going to use plastination. That's where you take deceased people and you remove the water and fat from these bodies and you replace it with various forms of plastic, silicon, epoxy, et cetera, so that you've got this preserved body that you've dissected down to whatever part you're trying to teach about. So we are purchasing 
quite a few different dissected body parts and whole bodies so that our students can learn from these plastinated bodies. And then we'll also be using imaging as an additional way to teach our students. And of course, imaging is the main way most of our students will wind up using anatomy in the future. And I've worn those same simulation goggles, and it is quite amazing to be able to walk around, remove an organ, turn it, reach into it. It's just this incredible, incredible technology. So compared to other medical school experiences where students spend their first year in large lecture halls, the KP School of Medicine will immediately start integrated clerkships. And you talked about that. And those will be in Kaiser Permanente hospitals and clinics. Why was this such an important component of the curriculum design? We thought it was really important to have our students be seeing the clinical relevance of what they're learning right from the beginning. And so we are using the model called the Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship, LIC. And the first year, the students will spend a half day a week in a clinical setting with a primary care provider, a family medicine physician or an internist and they will become a part of the care team that that physician works with. Uh, the care teams here you know, include nurses, pharmacists, social workers. It's a whole team together, as you know, and we think that'll be a great opportunity for our students to understand the value of team-based care and learn to respect the contributions of all different types of clinicians to a patient's care. This is also an apprenticeship style approach to learning. It is one student to one physician. And so the student will have a terrific experience with this very attentive setting in which they are the focus for education. And based on what's occurred at other schools that use this kind of a model, they will very quickly become a true member of the team and actively engaged in providing care for patients. As students more traditionally do during third year and then later in residency, they will be able to get up to speed quite quickly because they're part of this care team and it's a patient panel. So the patients will be coming back over time and the students will get to know the patients. The second year, we add four more LICs. They will have a half day a week in each of obstetrics, gynecology, pediatrics, psychiatry, and surgery. In addition, they will also have shifts in the emergency ward. So there's a lot of clinical experience, but this isn't just throwing them in and hoping they learn. We will be actively engaged with the physicians and teams that are working with the students, and those teams will understand what's going on in the curriculum back in the classroom and know which patients will be most relevant to what the students are learning at that time. That's great. So the curriculum that's being taught in the classroom will and the clerkship assignment in that period will be intertwined and linked together. Yes. And I have to tell you, I get late night calls from my son who's doing his clerkship at a Mayo facility to tell me about the, the C-section that occurred or the delivery that he uh, participated in with just incredible excitement. So it's such a wonderful experience for a rising medical school student. The KP School of Medicine is waiving tuition for the first five cohorts. This has been headline news. Why did the school decide to do this? So first of all, let me say that Kaiser Permanente has been very generous in not only establishing the school, but making it possible to waive tuition for the first five cohorts. And the motivation was that many of us had seen students show up at medical school dreaming of becoming a primary care provider or an infectious disease specialist or going into psychiatry or any of the fields that are on the lower end of the physician pay spectrum. And of course, all physicians are well paid um, compared to much of society, but still they were looking towards certain professions or they were looking to work in an underserved community. And what would happen is they would start to look at how much debt they had by the time they're in the middle of medical school. Among the students who have debt, and that's about 75%, the median is about $200,000 and it ranges up to 400000 The debt can be pretty substantial. Right. And we were seeing 
that a lot of these students were switching their career choice, not because they'd found a new passion for another field. And when you do find a new passion, that's terrific. And students should go into what they think they'll do best at and where they will be most helpful and most effective. But to see students switch what they want to do, not because they found something new, to still really prefer one thing, but go into something else because they just look at this debt and they see the years moving on and they get scared, that that really moved us. And we wanted to try to make it possible for students to not have debt be as much of a factor in their career choice, in the field they go into, and in where they choose to work. And that makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, I, I've read a number of reports on medical school student debt, and it's often equated to more than the average home mortgage. And it does influence the specialty decisions. So by removing that as an issue, you just create such a wonderful opportunity for students to follow their passion and hopefully to follow some of the clinical areas that have the greatest needs. That's the goal. So the first students will enter the school in 2020, and they'll be full practicing physicians in 2027 after their residency. Medical education is a lifelong journey that's not limited to medical school and residency. How are you preparing the curriculum so that we're providing these students with the tools and knowledge that they'll need in 2030, 2040, and beyond? It is really the case that what students learn their first year, much of it will be out of date by the time they graduate and certainly by the time they are done with their residency. And so a big part of our curriculum is to help these students become lifelong learners and to know how to do it. So they will learn how to assess new information, new technology, and decide whether to integrate it into their practice or whether to feel like we really need more research before we adopt what one study says. They'll understand that one new study that makes headlines all over the country when it's in conflict with 47 prior studies is not necessarily the way to go. They'll understand that you have to look at all of the research on a topic and understand whether the methodologies, whether it's good scientific work for just adopting new practices. And we expect that our students will not be afraid of change. They will embrace it. They'll expect it. And the same goes for technology. So the whole case-based approach that we're using, where they're working in groups, they will be looking up information. They will be finding it online, not in random places, but in online medical textbooks and in academic literature, and they will be using that to help figure out these cases. So they will take it for granted that one does that. That won't be a new skill they have to figure out on their own after they graduate. We want to teach them that from the beginning. That's excellent. And I would imagine that all of these students are really technology natives, and they'll be learning because they'll be doing clerkships within Kaiser Permanente facilities, they'll be learning from day one on electronic medical records and some of the most advanced technology in existence. And hopefully, they'll be the leaders of the future applications of technology. Yeah, it's a pretty great place for students to be doing their clinical work and learning because Kaiser Permanente is known for how sophisticated it is with technology and with innovation. And it'll be a really exciting thing for our students to be learning from people who've been innovating and in settings where innovation is taken for granted. Everybody wants to do better, where quality improvement is a part of the culture. That's wonderful. So the face of the medical school student is changing. It's disproportionately female. It's increasingly diverse, and more people are applying to medical school later in life, after graduate school, a separate career, or even after starting a family. What advice would you give to someone who is older or has another career and is considering medicine? I would say apply to our school. We, we will be excited to have students who have pursued another career and found their way to a desire to become a physician. We also will be excited about students who are in college and graduating and are going to come right to our school. We are looking for a wide range of students with a lot of diversity in their backgrounds. But for a student who is 
on the more experienced end of the spectrum, whether it's a career related to healthcare or not, I would encourage them, if that's what they want to do, to go for it. And also recognize what they've learned over the years and whatever it is they've done, whether they've been a homemaker raising kids, whether they've been an investment banker, whether they've been an actor or a carpenter or a police officer, whatever it is, they've learned a lot and they may not even realize until they think about it just how much they've learned that will be relevant to becoming a physician. And they should embrace that part of themselves and be proud of what they will bring to a medical school class and what they will bring to their patients. That's wonderful advice, that communicative side, the empathy side, all the things that you learn in a whole range of, of backgrounds and experiences could also be uh, very applicable to their medical school application. Definitely. Terrific. So permanente medicine is unique and, in my opinion, the model of care for the future. That said, we're far from the only health care provider in the United States. How will students be well-versed in the complexities that exist across the national health care landscape? Because we expect these students are going to go out and tackle the world across multiple medical centers and medical systems. And we want them to be well-equipped physicians for any organization and any environment they face. Yeah, absolutely. We want them to go everywhere. There is a misconception that we are expecting our students to stay within the Kaiser Permanente system. And while it's a wonderful system and we anticipate that some will stay, the goal is to prepare our students to go out anywhere and work in any setting in any part of the country and beyond. In terms of understanding the healthcare system, a big part of our curriculum is health system science. And so we will be teaching our students about health disparities, quality of care and quality improvement. We will teach them about access to care, cost of care, value of care, population and community health, a number of topics that we think will help them practice in many different settings. In addition, they as part of their standard time in the longitudinal integrated clerkship, they will spend a half day a week in a community health center and get to see a setting that is different from a Kaiser Permanente clinical setting. And that's during the first two years. And then in the third and fourth year, when they are doing clinical rotations beyond the LIC, not only will they be able to go to any of the Kaiser Permanente sites around the country, any of our regions, but they'll also be able to do rotations and other settings to see what academic medicine is like, to see what community hospitals are like, and to see what private practices are like. So they will understand the broad array of ways in which healthcare is organized and delivered. That sounds terrific. And I'm assuming that these community health centers are going to be from diverse populations and economically disadvantaged centers that will will open the minds and the horizons of the students. That's the goal. So the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine has been discussed for over a decade. And five years ago, I had the privilege of being brought in to support the business planning and ultimately to support a decision to open the school. While it's expected that the school will have a profound impact on the 48 students that will enter in 2020, as well as the faculty working directly with them, I'm interested, Dr. Schuster, in how you think the school will invigorate the passion across the entire Kaiser Permanente organization, from our clinicians to our staff, all the way to the corporate offices. I think being around students is so energizing. Students ask hard questions. They, you know, keep us on our toes. They get everyone around them excited because they are so passionate and often so idealistic. They remind us of who we were. They remind us of why we went into medicine and what we're able to do, what we're capable of doing. I've been going around to college campuses and talking to pre-meds to let them know about our new school. And every time I come back so excited, these young folks are so energetic and so caring, so compassionate, so creative. It's just wonderful. And it just gives me a taste of what it's going to be like to be in our school 
with all of these students. So I think that the larger Kaiser Permanente will benefit from having students around and all that students bring to an organization. I think it's going to be great. I agree. I think it'll bring that spark and that reminder. Every, every one of our 23,000 physicians at one point wrote their application letter that talked about their altruistic focus and their desire to have a positive impact on humanity and being kind of reintroduced to um, perhaps themselves 20 years later in the face of a new medical school student. I think it's just a wonderful reminder of the privilege of the profession and the privilege of going to medical school. Yeah, definitely. So let's jump ahead. Let's turn the clock ahead now 24 years. And the first 20 cohorts of students have graduated from the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine, and they're having an impact on Kaiser Permanente, but perhaps even more profoundly on the healthcare industry as a whole. What's your vision look like? What impact is this school having on healthcare? Well, to start with, I really hope that Others are learning from how we have developed our curriculum and the design of our school, and we will learn from others as well. Other places have been so generous in sharing with us what they're doing, and now, as I said, we're bringing it all together, but we will share back what we learn, and we expect to be in an ongoing dialogue, part of the community of medical schools where all of us are trying to improve. So I do hope that we have been able to make a difference in medical education in the country. And then in terms of our students, I hope they're everywhere. I hope that some are in community health centers and some are in private practice. Some are advocates. Some are leaders. Some may have gone into elective office. Some may be in public health departments. Some might become writers and help translate what goes on in the healthcare system through the media to share with others. I, I just hope that they are making a difference in so many different settings. That's a wonderful <laughs> vision, and, and I think you're right. I truly believe that the students that come out of this new medical school are going to be having such a profound impact across every component of society. Well, Dr. Schuster, this has been such a pleasure to spend the afternoon with you. I can guarantee you I will be in the front row in 2020 of the White Coat Ceremony to welcome those bright-eyed medical school students in, and four years later to congratulate them at the commencement ceremony. And I hope that many of those students will be the future physicians that all of us have the privilege to see for our own clinical care. Well, I am very excited to have you at our White Coat Ceremony and at our graduation and many graduations to come. I really appreciate all the support you have personally given to the development of the school and all the support of the Permanente Federation and the Kaiser Foundation Hospitals and Health Plan and all of the Kaiser Permanente Enterprise. Thank you very much for talking with me today. I really appreciate your questions and your taking the time to learn more about our school. Thank you so much. What a wonderful discussion with Dr. Mark Schuster, the founding dean of the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. That's our show for today. I'm Chris Grant, your host. You can stream our podcast by visiting permanente.org or by subscribing on iTunes or Google. And you can always find me on Twitter at CM Grant and Dr. Schuster at Dr. Mark Schuster. We'll see you next time.